much. Yes, everything's all great. Great. Okay. Thanks. Um, well, thanks for inviting me, and and great to be to be at least virtually in in Canada. Um, I always thought Canada was only about trees, but recently I discovered exactly a very beautiful, interesting country. Um, the first image is just to reflect on being part of this virtual world of Zoom and Teams and all those kind of meetings. My whole office is in disarray for the last two years. I've only been in, in my office physically twice. Everybody is operating from all kinds of funny places and it works. And that's the great message, it works. So a new kind of way of working in which we're all living in a virtual landscape doing virtual projects, uh, but ultimately for the real world. Um, okay. Right, I am um, just by being invited to Guelph, I, I had to think about, um, remind me about uh, Geoffrey Jellico. The, he's the kind of schoolmaster, the grandmaster, the grand schoolmaster of British landscape architecture. He was um, the guy who made the link between landscape and subconsciousness. But more important, he became famous because of the Guelph lectures. Uh, so I'm feeling um, today I'm stepping in the footsteps of Sir Jeffrey Jellicoe by giving not a series of lectures, but at least one lecture about landscape design in Guelph. Now, the Jeffrey Jellicoe lectures became a book and, and uh, you should know it. Um, if you don't know it, find it because it's a, it's a, it's a cracker of a, of a, of a legacy, of, an, of a lifelong uh, work experience. But the good thing or the interesting thing is that in, in, the, in the preface, the introduction of the book, he quoted David Hockney and the painter. And he said, uh, it's a very good advice to believe only what an artist does rather than what he says about his work. So please don't listen at all about what I'm saying, just looking at the images and make your own, your own uh, opinion and your own uh, your own imagination. So Grossmax, today I'm a bit nostalgic because I just discovered and we should have a big party because of COVID and all this virtual world we live in, it hasn't happened, but Grossmax actually exists uh, this year, 25 years. So 25 years of work I, um, I can talk about. And, and that of course made me in a slightly in a reflective mood and, and, and partly so also to think about how we started. When we started, we were obnoxious. We were, uh, we were rebellious. We were kicking against the system um, in order to get known. And now here we are working on all kinds of projects around the world with famous architects and still trying, at least trying, at least to have a little seed of this original rebellion to keep that, to keep the home fires burning, uh, to say. Now, if I talk about landscape, I have to talk about architect, uh, architecture and, and architects. And, and of course, we, uh, they are all kind of collaborators. Uh, but as we all know, architects have the kind of towering egos, the kind of, the kind of big ambitions. This is quite different from our profession, the landscape architect, which is much more down to earth, much more reflective, it's about philosophy, it's about uh, chains of time, it's about a slow transformation. Um, but in all of this, of course, I, I got my heroes and, and this is uh, the two Greek gods, uh, the Dionysian and the Apollyon. Uh, as a kind of duality, uh, and you could say that on the left, Dionysian, it's about, it's about party, it's about exity, it's about hedonism, it's about the heat of the moment. And Apollyon is more about rigor, structure, organization, and dare I say, architecture. But I think the good thing and the interesting thing about landscape architecture is that we can reconcile those opposite forces in one project. And then there's another thing about landscape. Uh, and of course, on the on, on the left, uh, we're seeing 
the painting by Manet, the Grand Picnic, and, and on the right is a picture of, of the English Garden in Munich, so the hardcore conservative Germany, and give them a piece of nature and all hell break loose. And I, I put those two, two images together to, to talk about that landscape is, is and remains the longing for the long lost paradise. I think that's the kind of on the underlying drive and the romantic drive in, in, our, in our profession, looking for the long lost paradise. And although I put landscape against architecture, of course, it's, it's both about the void. Landscape is maybe about capturing the wide horizon of the void. And maybe architecture is capturing, encapsulating the void in, 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 in a built fabric. But of course, um, I, I always, uh, although I made a joke about architects, I, I really believe that we are in this kind of transient zone between landscape and architecture. And, and zooming in, zooming out between the built form and the, and the, and the ex external environment. Another thing is about um, is about how global the landscape profession has become. Um, I sometimes say we are the children of the Google Earth Revolution. Um, you know, when I started uh, as a student uh, in the 1980s, it was very clear that the Dutch landscape was different from the Danish landscape, was different from the German landscape, was different from the French landscape, and different from the Americans. And now we're living in one big blur, one big hybrid blend. Um, you could be positive and negative about it. I, I do it more as an observation. I'm not making a kind of value judgment here, but it's, you know, the, the, the idea of, a, of landscape as an identity of a national uh, occurrence of landscape, of course, has, has gone and, um, and something to think about. Then, of course, landscape is foremost a visual discipline. It's, it's about, it's about Quite frankly, for me, it's about painting. But on the left hand is the uh, an image of the Draftsman contract, Peter Greenaway film. On the right hand, my favorite film by Antonioni is uh, film is called Blown Up. But you know, landscape is about observing, and either on the right hand side is about zooming in, or on on, on the left hand is is framing. It's 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 a visual way, either in a poetic artistic or in a scientific, precise way, uh, observing the landscape. And there's great examples throughout history. On the left-hand side, a more early scientific way of making the colors of the sky, that, that little circle you see, that color circle of blue is, is about all the colors of blue you can see in the sky. And that was a fantastic way of recording in the 18th century about that observation. And on the right hand, Gilpin, who wrote a lot about landscape, this is some of his notebooks, and again, observing the colors in the sky and drawing it. And that, that is landscape. Landscape is about observing and it's about visuality. Now, and this, this, this image looks like a very contemporary uh, sketch of a contemporary, maybe expressionist artist, but it's not. What we're seeing here is in uh, part of a manifesto uh, by Cosens, who developed a new methodology of landscape, uh, a new methodology of landscape painting. And his idea was that nature in itself is never perfect. We have to kind of perfect nature in our own mind. And a way of, of drawing and painting landscape was making a big blur of ink and then let your fantasy go and then draw the rocks and the trees and the mountains, et cetera. And very subconscious, I talked about Jellico, he would be probably very pleased with this reference. This is kind of the subconsciousness of what you see and make that into a landscape, not the real landscape in itself, something that's born out of your own imagination. So yes, uh, I believe landscape is to think uh, and to think is to speculate with images, as, as I quoted by uh, the Renaissance uh, scholar uh, Bruno. And that's what we do in Grossmax. We kind of speculate 
with images. And uh, because of Nadia is uh, probably, I mean, I just talked to her before this talk, but I think she's now up to her book number six, which we proudly contributed towards in a chapter about, um, about landscape visualization. Um, so it's, it's an important aspect and it also makes us different from other disciplines because it links us not just to architecture, but it links us to the world of visual arts. So the very early gross uh, max image here, we like the idea of being seduced uh, by nature. And, and this is a collaboration of Gross Max with the American art artist Mark Dion uh, for a project in London about a vertical garden. But again, the image is about drawing you in, drawing in the, the strange perspective of drawing you in into the, uh, the realm of the project. And landscape is about a journey through space and time. It's, it's a very cinematic experience. In, in all kinds of ways. This, this image we, we made for a project in Glasgow and for university. And um, when I presented this project, this, this image was being rejected by the counselor of the university as the girl was being too sexy. So when I made the same image with a spotty, greasy hat, um, Scottish boy, it was being allowed as being sufficient. But at least they kept a little boy with the, uh, the fox you see on the... On the, on the, on the on the left hand side. So images are important because images are not just about representing the product as a kind of before and after. It's very much more about the in-between. The image is the manifesto of the product. So often we start a product with the image in order then uh, to bring the product alive within the office. So often we start with the image long before we start to design the plan in a way, the figure ground, uh, how, how it looks like in a more architectural way. So all kind of images about Grossmax in this idea, partly the idea of the sublime, the surreal, the colors, but it's all about atmospheres, it's about light and, and, and context. So all those, some of those images, at least, I think we selected 10 for Nadia's new book. And, 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 and I think I called my little contribution, every picture tells a story. And I literally be going to the depths of each picture and try to unravel what's the narrative and why, why did we came up with this kind of idea of visualization. And this was part of an, um, a little study which was called Old Town, New Town, No Town. And it was a study about the city of Edinburgh in which we uh, kind of presented the, the, the observations like an in Victorian travelogue booklet. And uh, this is another image of the same, the same publication. And we imagine a kind of fox hunt, but of course foxes are not stupid. Uh, they don't live in the countryside, they live in suburbia. So and we imagine this kind of suburban fox hunt of, you know, jumping the bypass and the kind of suburban fences to catch the fox. And another image about coming old new town, which we revisited as, an, as a part of an exhibition about uh, Old Town, uh, New Town, New Nation. A more recent project, we, we actually got the commission to work on the Heathrow Airport and the, and the Heathrow, Heathrow Airport landscape. And in order to, to get the product, we, we went in with a provocation. Uh, we were young, we were, we were small. Um, and we thought if, we, if we, we only can get this job, this big job, by, um, by being ourselves. And this was a very early uh, sketch about putting the Union Jack on the airport landscape as a kind of big symbol of arriving in post-Brexit uh, Britain. So a range of images about, this is Kew Gardens, about new nature, and then the atmosphere is, is goes with that. And the idea of, in this case, mixing architecture, we love the idea of the glass house and mixing that up with the idea of 
artificial landscape within and this was the idea of an natural swimming but in an industrial glasshouse context now with retrospect of with hindsight uh, there's all kind of connections we can make so on the left was a, one of those very early cross max image, uh, images i showed you and much later, I visited in, in Boston the, the museum and I found this uh, on the right, this painting by Martin Heat. And I thought, my gosh, that's our image. But hey, that's an 18th, you know, 19th century uh, painting. And it's quite interesting to get somehow inspiration in retrospect. And another one, the, the image I showed you about the iceberg. Um, Product, uh, about climate change and nuclear powered iceberg on the left and on the right, a painting by Cole of the same area of the 1850s, this kind of sublime area when the American painters went both to the pole and both to South America and discovered different climatic zones. And somehow it all comes together in this kind of blur of, of imagery. And that's, that's, that's what makes this thick. I just, just returned from Iceland. I was there, it's my first real international travel after the lockdown we had in, in Great Britain. And, and the volcano is up and running in Iceland and, and reminds me on the right hand side, the Grand Tour, the, the Grand Tour of the, you know, every British um, person of, of certain kind of initiation has to do the Grand Tour. And, and of course, you went to Italy to see the Vesuvius and, and, and then you could die and because you have seen it. But now we have a new Grand Tour instead of turning south, we're turning north. So we like this, but it's all about the sublime and, and the landscape as this wonderful artifact. Um, this is actually a, a project we're doing, I cannot talk, it's still in competition uh, in Iceland, but one of the ideas is between the airport and the city of Reykjavik to make this light installation which represents the Northern, the northern Lights. So painting is, is a big inspiration for us. And of course, on first call is the Western painting about, and, and I'm Dutch myself, very much also the Dutch way of painting the landscape, the pregnant skies, the horizon, the foreground, the middle ground, the background. But there's also another way of painting and, and also in Gross Max as um, we are very international, I'm Dutch, but I think we nearly got as many nationalities uh, as people walking in the office. So we got also our own uh, group of Chinese and we do regularly projects and competitions in, in China. And the idea in China of painting the landscape in a much more uh, a different way, in a different narrative, which is much more cinematic, the kind of long scroll drawings, which is, don't have the normal perspective or the, or the Western perspective, but another way of, of organizing the fields. And, and we're very inspired by this because this is also landscape as a cinematic experience. And uh, this is one of our recent competitions in China in, in which we became finalists. And, and some of the drawings we produced were literally six, seven, eight meters long scrolls of literally drawing the landscape as one big sweep. Another way of looking at landscape um, is this card game. It's called the endless landscape. And what we see here is on each, each level, we see, I think we see nine cards. And so in total, we got 36 cards. But however you group those cards, they always line up, the horizon will line up. So you can make any kind of imaginary landscape out of this group of cards, you know, millions of landscapes. And isn't that inspiring? So I think all what we de need to do as landscape architects is to de design one card uh, and, and multiply it and being able to make this kind of catalog of landscapes. It's fascinating stuff. And it's all part of our own history. Now, another link between the world of painting for me is very much the world of cinema. 
And this is a quotation of Werner Herzog, one of my favorite filmmakers. And, uh, and the book is fantastic. It's called Guide for the Perplexed. And that should be any good title for any kind of landscape book. But, but he really looks to landscape, not as a kind of background, not as a, scenic, a scenery, but as, a, as, a, as an integral part of, of what he tries to represent. And the landscape representing our deepest emotions and, and nightmares, it's madness and confusion. And, uh, and so he says that his role as a filmmaker is not only direct uh, actors, but also literally to direct the landscape itself. And uh, not only the landscape, but also animals. And so here's a painting of my hero, Werner Herzog, the filmmaker, with the way how he orchestrates landscapes and animals. So yes, landscape is all about it's about intensity, it's about atmospheres, but more than that, it's about the completely absor uh, absorbing of smells. It's a completely the way of, of being into ecstasy. Now I show you a couple of images of, 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 of landscape as it's a project we've done for the Botanic Gardens in Edinburgh. This is a park we've done in London. Uh, this is a part we've done in, in, in Germany. It's about using landscape to kind of create a sense of intensity of nature condensed as experience. And uh, again, one of our projects in, in the right bank in the, in the center of London, probably one of the biggest roof gardens uh, on the Goldman Sachs headquarters. Um, and again, it's about bringing nature and juxtapose it against the skyline of the city. Now, we, we're not the first, and we're not on our own. And again, we're looking back to history, uh, Botticelli, this fantastic uh, painting about the seasons. And, and we really, <laughs> in a kind of a rather fanatic, um, how do we say it, nearly kind of uh, nerdy way, we, we analyzed all those little plants you see on, in the meadow on the, on, on, on the foreground. These are real plants. They were really precisely drawn, but at the same time, there is a narrative about the seasons and and um, and spring, etc. So we, we we found inspiration in those things. Again, one of our projects for London, in which we try to take the one image and bring it to the different atmospheres and the different seasons. And on the left, a painting by uh, Dürer a piece of turf, but we say, all right, a piece of turf doesn't need to be a piece of turf. We can intensify the piece of turf. And that's what we do in the middle and to the right. And that's, that's our philosophy. It's about nature activation. It's not about conservation because then we just kept to the image on the left, you know, the, the original piece of turf. No, our approach is nature conservation is a kiss of death or ideas about activating nature. Now, of course, another one of our big heroes in this story is Charles Darwin. And I'm going to show you a project. This is quite secretive. Not many people know about this, this little anecdote. So I will tell you a great lesson about Darwin and landscape architecture. So Darwin was friends with Joseph Hooker, which is on the, the guy with the beard on the left hand uh, uh, of this picture. And Joseph Hooker was the director of Kew Gardens in the 1850s. And, and Hooker and, and Darwin, they were buddies, they were, they were friends. And um, they came together on this one project in the middle of nowhere between Africa and South America, an island called the Ascension Island which is basically a volcanic plug. It's an old volcano, uh, volcanic landscape uh, in the middle of nowhere, but extremely, at the time, uh, strategic in the kind of colonial empire of Britain of moving the ships around the world. However, on this island, there were no trees, there was no sweet water. And so what to do? Now, 
Charles Darwin made a very cunning plan to say, well, if we can plant tree on top of the extinct volcano, and, and it doesn't matter where the trees come from, South America, Africa, Cuba, and South, just pull them all together and create a completely artificial ecosystem, which he did. Uh, and these are some pictures. Um, and, and David, uh, David Richards, in my literally visited the island to, to study all this. Uh, on top of this island, a completely artificial ecosystem of all those different vegetation was being established, creating a fantastic green environment, but most important, a, a dew pond. Because of the trees, the clouds were gathering around the island and started to release their moisture into rain, uh, filling in this uh, man-made pond. Uh, which was the first access to sweet water on this island. Now, I love this example because it shows that you can make nature. You don't have to protect nature. You don't have to cuddle nature. You actually can activate nature. Nature is a force, a tool of force uh, to our benefit if we know how to initiate it. Another one of my heroes is Alexander Pope. Now, Alexander Pope, uh, the 18th century poet um, who wrote a lot about landscape and he invented the idea of genius loci, you know, the, trying to get into the essence of the place. Genius loci was his word. And that, I would say, until very recently, that was the kind of the, the, key, the key to our profession. Genius loci, that's all what we do as landscape architects. We try to get into the skin of, of, of the side and release its inner, its inner identity. However, what happens if there's non site So many of the projects we encounter these days, they don't have an identity, they lost it. It's wasteland, it's, it's, it's terrain fake, it's the kind of Zwiesenstadt in German, the in-between. So what do we do if there is no identity? And then I think, and that's, I invented a new kind of, um, uh, kind of slogan. It's not longer genius loci, it's to be ingenious loci. We, we have to be ingenious as landscape architect to re, re, literally reinvent to make um, a new identity. And that's um, part of many of our projects as it stands. Right, I quickly take you through a little tour around uh, some cities around the world. I'll take you around Berlin and I think I'll take you afterwards to Paris. Maybe we go to London. Beijing, and hopefully if there is time, we end up in the city of Toronto, showing some of our, our recent works. This was a competition we won a while ago, probably at that time, the biggest landscape competitions for um, to, to reconsider the airport of Tempelhof into a new public uh, people's park. And of course, in order to do so, so we not only look to the park itself, but look how the park was sitting in the wider green fabric of the city of Berlin. So Temple of Airport, which is of course a very uh, uh, loaded uh, site, you know. Um, I'm Dutch, I'm not German, but I probably am a bit biased to certain aspects of uh, German identity and and so this was a well let's put put it this way this image you see at the moment on the screen I think I only used once in the presentation in Germany and then I decided it wasn't a good idea. <clears throat> However the site fantastic it's about 380 hectares of urban void you know in, in what do you do and how do you make that into a new typology of public park. Now, of course, we inspired <coughs> not only to, to, to history, but also to the culture of this is, again, when is the filmmaker is who made the film Himmel über Berlin. And imagine looking down on Berlin and having a new kind of overview. 
and for the for the idea of the temple of airport it was about encircling the airport with this kind of movement this is planes circling the circling the sky but that was the idea of how to capture the void and these are very early um, uh, studies about the project but it it already shows the idea of encircling and trying to capture the void by means of circulations and intensity and some of the, the, the models we made for that and some of the drawings uh, but but ultimately the project is about the void it's about the meadow uh, it's about a new way of having openness as a kind of contrast and, and, and Nietzsche wrote very well about it the, the, the philosopher which I already mentioned um, about the need for having this wide expanse of openness in the city to let you kind of your own fantasy go wild now although we show you a lot of drawings this project was very much much more like a diagram in the sense of a timeline of how do you start with the catalyst products and how it then start to evolve over time so it's a bit like like in ecology you got pioneer um, colonization and over time that becomes climax vegetation and we see the same in urbanistic words so that you have a climax sorry and, and pioneer urbanization and it becomes a climax urbanization so it's a transformation over a long period of time but in order to kick start the process we really had to make a database and an understanding of the biodiversity and the ecology on the side uh, this fantastic new kind of flora uh, occupying the landscape uh, but then we also had to intervene and this was my dream and i don't think it's, it's happened i still would like to do it this little fighter pilot rat baron plane and then seeding seed bumps literally bombing the sites as you would do and nearly then creating jackson pollock kind of uh, landscape planting plan for the the new uh, biodiversity. So some images of the projects, the, the wide expanse of openness, the new alignments in the scheme, uh, utilizing the runways and on the left hand side, sorry, on the, on the horizon you see this little lump, that's the only vertical element we positioned in the landscape. It's meant to be in 60 meter high artificial rock, um, which could contain a climbing school on the inside uh, inspired very much by von Humboldt, who got the sections of the Andes Mountains. But um, first, I understood about the latitude of plants depending on the heights and different um, ecotypes accordingly. And that would be represented in this monument for von Humboldt in the center of Berlin. And when we were doing this, and then when I show you this first picture, it looks a bit phallic and didn't look that great. But how funny things could go, I found this rock. Well, I didn't. My daughter found this rock on the beach uh, just around the corner where I live. And it looks so great. So all what we've done is we forgot our original design. We took this rock, we put it in a 3D scanner. and uh, And literally modeled or 60 meter high monument as a tribute to von Humboldt containing a, um, a, um, a climbing school on the inside. Again, the whole, uh, whole idea about the site was about activation, uh, spontaneous temporary events, utilizing the paraphernalia of airports as, as structures and outposts and belvedere's and beehives for for creating new ecologies etc and here we see some how it evolves um it's a long story to be told we don't have time uh, because some of our design never ever materialized but people occupying and make the site to run quickly go to paris we've done a little 
um, investigation for Paris because we were shortlisted to redesign the landscape around the Eiffel Tower. And the in, interesting thing about most cities is that most cities, you don't know anything about what's below the cities in terms of geology, geomorphology, soils. But we found for the city of Paris some really beautiful maps about the river Seine and the natural landscape uh, as a kind of abiotic substrate below the city of Paris. And it became very much an inspiration for, for our product. So we were fascinated about how cities like Berlin, like Paris, like London, like Toronto are kind of urbanized landscapes and to trying to map this out and trying to understand that that's the essence of, of many of our, of our projects. So to carefully map, in this case, the cultural landscape of, in this case, all the, the landscape, the, the Baroque gardens sitting in this river valley landscape along the uh, river San. But our project was about the Eiffel Tower and, and also literally below the Eiffel Tower, this, this deposition of, 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 of groundwater, high quality groundwater sitting in, as, a, as a bubble uh, right bank in the city center of Paris. So our project was all about bringing this to the foreground. And of course, this was a time that the climate treaty was being signed in the city of Paris. Hilgado, the, the woman mayor of Paris, a very strong ecological uh, sustainable agenda. So we trying to kind of reimagine the landscape around the Eiffel Tower as this new kind of green machinery, but of course paying tribute to its past as well. So I'll show you a series of drawings and observations about that. That, that project, including this kind of central meadow as a new outdoor living room for the citizens of Paris. And the idea that we discovered that grasses are much better to capture carbon from the air than even trees. And, and so we have special grasses to make this central meadow the kind of big carbon sink of the city of Paris. Right, London. Um, we, I like to talk about the projects in this band of the River Thames. Again, the Thames, the, the, the natural lifeline of the city of London and this kind of former marshland, which is now the kind of prime urban, uh, you know, the Falpole land in the city of London. And it's, again, you can be a bit cynical about this project because in this particular project, it's one client, it's Knight Dragon, a developer from Hong Kong. It's going to develop literally 70 hectares of prime urban land along the river Thames in London. And we are doing the landscape. And we're doing the landscape on, on, on different levels from the original master plan all the way to some of the details of the park and the waterfront, which I will show you in, in a moment. And one of the ideas of this project was to and circle this kind of new urban conglomeration. It is this kind of loop. And the origin was called the P5K, a five kilometer long running track. Um, but it became a new, a new way of trying to kind of somehow create a new structure and a new kind of dynamics in this urban fabric. And some of the drawings of the first installments of this project of the waterfront and and very much the first installment was this raised linear walkway and we designed this in collaboration with Dillis Cofidio Renfro from from New York and obviously we quite often work with these days and this was our first collaborations um, in, in London about this kind of it's not the highline because the highline is of course the quintessential race walk. This is slightly more like a folly and kind of way of winding your way to the urban fabric um, and finding new perspectives and a new way of merging landscape and build form and, and need like a catwalk or kind of event space 
uh, emerging from the sky. Um, as a way, dare I say, as a way of commodity of literally, I mean, the, 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 the intention of the, of the client, the developer is to put this area on the map. In the good old days, our, our clients were hard-nosed product offices. These days, our clients are, are from the marketing departments. They want commodity. They want something to talk about. They want narratives. Anyway, I show you some of the images which goes this in a slightly pop art way and winds its way to a kind of non-space leading the central space towards the waterfront in a kind of celebrating way. Um, and all kind of artifacts, it is famous artists, I don't like him, Damius Hirst is rather grotesque, but all part of this new way of putting areas on the urban map. Right, Beijing, China. Now, Beijing is of course a fantastic city in a way how the urban grid is surrounded by this horseshoe of mountains. It's, it's really feng shu in, in, in all its basics about that's the place how to build the city where the mountains and then the grid links the, um, the palace to the celestial world. And it, it, it's really fascinating to see about the Chinese history, about allocating built forms in the landscape as part of a bigger philosophy. So we were inspired when we were asked to do a park right back in the center, the, the central business district of Beijing. And we discovered that the, the height of the new towers, which is about 500, 600 meters high, is the same height as the, the, the ring of the, of the surrounding landform around the city of Beijing. And that became part of our idea of making this artificial mountain rains as part of our composition of a 500 meter long park. So we, we took the idea of the mountain and we modeled it in a kind of abstract uh, metal beams way which would become, become a completely um, landmark way of representing the landscape in a completely artificial way. But if you're below this is a shopping center, so using a valley of shopping, and then you, you will see this structure, which is also nearly reads like the heartbeat, uh, as you see in, in the medical instrument. Um, so it's a way of seeing it by car, by seeing it from the air, seeing it from below or from the ground as a, this great, great kind of manifestation of the mountains surrounding the city of Beijing. And that sits in a new uh, strip of artificial forest. And all kind of artifacts, this is a moon pond, that, that, that full moon, full moon we have the full projection of the moon if it's, it's the shallow moon the new moon you see a little crescent and different ways of integrating this landscape into the urban fabric right now very finally toronto yeah, because yes and, and i think nadia didn't realize but gross max is working in toronto we were part of a winning design for lakeshore drive um, it's a site between, literally between the airport and downtown Toronto. And, and this was quite a challenge because how, how to do a kind of landscape and how to do a kind of urbanism in Toronto coming from Europe. So we very much together with the architects, we, are, we were kind of evolving the idea of the picturesque which I'll show you in a moment. I mean, trying to dissolve the grid, like most of Toronto sits on the grid. This, this 10 hectare site used to be an old factory and somehow we could dissolve the grid in a much more um, different kind of footprint. Now, this is of course not Toronto, this is Rome. The, the idea of the, the, the figure ground um, but the idea here is to make an idea of a townscape inspired by this kind of urbanism and combine it with high rise, but the kind of the picturesque way of organizing. These are some of our study models on the left, 
with the towers, or at least representation of the towers. But on the right, when we take the towers away, you get this kind of much more relaxed patchwork feel of how the whole scheme intermingles and come together. As some of the original boards, of when we won the competition by dissolving the grid, by bringing in the landscape and let it flow through the scheme, actually a rather landscape approach to a piece of urbanism. And of course, the beauty about this project is, and maybe that doesn't happen too often because we, we have one ownership of 10 hectares of land, we can make what we call in German a Gesamtkunstwerk. We can make a total work of art. We can make the whole um, conglomeration of the urban fabric as one design concept. And one of the ideas on the left was to, to make a forest city, also to, to draw the trees from the valleys, from the ground, on the roofs, on the terraces, and on the podium decks. So we got a kind of three-dimensional landscape. Uh, this is much more ground plane, and on the right, trying to find ways and, and systems of linking the, the urban fabric and linking it back to Lake Ontario, and making it a part of the valley systems. And so the whole landscapes and strangles the schemes and infiltrate the scheme and becomes part of the kind of defining. Um, uh, way of structuring the site itself. So some of the drawings, and this is an endless project, I can show you hundreds of drawings, uh, but maybe interesting on the right, the kind of little catalog of buildings from low rise to high rise and, and the way how those are becoming part of those picturesque groupings. And on the left, a kind of catalog of little from small, medium, large and extra large pieces of landscape and together those ing ingredients are the way of how we're cooking the meal of uh, making this Lakeshore Drive uh, program. And some of the images which goes with as products and also the urbanism, it's, 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 it's going to be more slightly more European. The markets like we see in Covent Garden and, and, and Borough Market in London and, and the valleys become abstracted urban valleys in the urban fabric. And, uh, and of course, the idea in the Toronto, and as I always say, Canada is the world of the lumberjacks. So let's plant trees. And, and one of my aims in this project is to plant as many as trees as, as possible. So anyway, we can plant a tree. We want to play, uh, plant a tree so people ultimately live in a kind of forest city in this part of Toronto. Right, sorry, I took far too long. So this is my story. Um, and if there's 